Welcome once again to The Lost Signals Discusses Games and Gaming Culture, a pretentious, philosophical, pedantic podcast where we focus on various aspects of video games as well as other issues and topics within gaming in general. Hello there, welcome back to Lost Signals and the spring season of Games and Gaming Culture. It's sort of like we don't really do it on a set schedule but usually it does come back in the spring ish time so it's about time for that and of course when we do come back with this uh with the show we do our top games so last year it was only two of us and this year will be the same i am scott thurlow i probably i'm going to cover 80 percent of the games and steve on steven amosi who is here with me will cover the rest of the 20 percent yeah i played at least four games last year so Mm -hmm. we're good to go and that's a pushing it on in terms of your schedule sure (laughs) So no, so technically, I mean, obviously it's April 2021 as of this recording, but these are our 2020 games because you sort of like do a little buffer, like you know anything that came out in the end of the year and anything early into this year. So without further ado, I guess I'll kick it off um, because I have got five games. So we'll do top games first, but we'll count backwards. So five, four, you know, fifth best, etc., up to the best. So I will just lead off, and Steve, oh, this is actually a good one because I know it's a game you've actually played, and if you're watching this, it's his background. Doom Eternal is my fifth best best game of the year. And yeah, man, like it's I sort of shuffled it around like I, I had it uh an honorable and not in the top games like earlier, but you know, as leading up to this episode, I was just like just giving everything else a once over. I'm like, okay, am I sure I want this and that here? So I did bump it up like a while back to number five that we love the twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, you know, reboot modern version of Doom actually a bit better than that even to like for various small like subtle like but helpful like um i guess quality of life tweaks and just in general of a time it's doom fps modern gen looks great and i i'll say this it still runs great also uh, on my old workhorse base ps4 original one so like yeah. yeah man like it's just a blast to blast demons and to see them rendered and stuff and explode in modern graphics and all the weapons and etc just a hell of a time and they did some i mentioned it on real quickly on pop culture roundup earlier uh, just before this that they put out two dlcs part one and part two and part two just came out and i feel as if that's the perfect cap off for doom eternal and yeah it was a great ride and number five for me yeah i mean in terms of doom uh, real quickly i i'm gonna talk about this a little bit later on in my list because not sure the last thing on my list but um in terms of the way that doom plays like normally i don't play dlcs for doom i'm like all in on these because (laughs) doom is like just very nostalgic for me and also they did a very good job of reimagining it in 2016 and then reimagining it again for eternal um i think it's great i i think that for the most part it's plays better than the 2016 game there are a couple like gripes that i have that i'll talk about in a little bit but um as far as my number four game, because I don't have a, t- I don't have a top five. I've only, I only played four games that came out last year, like all the way through. Um, so I, I guess I can mention two really, really quickly here because the first one I didn't play a lot of, but you got me onto the Kentucky Route Zero and game, was and, and, and like it is, it, like it's a really interesting concept. Uh, I just stopped playing it because like it's not my type of game per se um it's more of a story based like not so much like you don't get to play as anything it's more like a point click type of thing exactly and uh that's not always my my jam so it was intriguing it was good for what i played but uh, like i I got distracted in on other things so i guess i'll put that as number five and um but like for real my my list really starts here uh miles morales uh the, it's basically the same well it's exactly the same engine as the uh spider-man game that came out from 18, 18 i believe 18, i believe yeah. Yeah. uh and it is a lot of fun it's great to get like into like in the same way it was great to get into peter parker's skin it's great to get into miles morales skin and like 
you know, play through his, the storyline that they made for him, which is really good. Um, very solid. I'm excited for you. Like, this is the, by the way, this is the only one that only I played of like all of the, you know, uh, signals over here. Like this is the only game that only I played because everybody else is waiting for the PS5 version uh, till, till, till anybody can actually get their hands on a PS5 to play this exactly. game. So um, I will say you're in for a treat. It's a great game. It, you know, I know you loved the, I think the original Spider-Man was like pretty cool. Uh, on one of your top five games that year. I believe right? it was number three that year, if I yeah. recall. And only because God of War also came out that year. So. And God of War is one of the best games ever. But, like, yes, uh, it is on par with that game. It's a little bit shorter, but it's still like it, it almost plays, it almost feels like an extended DLC. Right. That's what I heard it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's fucking great. It's its own storyline. It's all Miles stuff. And his story is so interesting. Like, you know, I love um, uh, Spider Verse. Uh, is one of the best movies the last few years that came out. Uh, and I think that this really does Miles' story justice in the same, in a similar way to that. Um, mm. So I will say that's going to be number four. Uh, great game. But these other three games that I played, like I only played games all the way through that I really love these days. So you're going to get some good ones from me <laughs> and also from Scott coming up. There'll so. be some overlap. Yeah. yeah. I'll leave but it no, off there. Yeah, but no, like, so you're right. Like, and also a bitch at you because um, I, of course, want, I'm still, like you said, if the scalpers were stopped stealing all the PS5s, like my plan was to get it. And the one cool thing they're doing generally, a, a number of games, <laughs> and Miles Morales is one of them, is that you get it when, let's say you hypothetically get your PS5, Steve-O, you will get an upgrade for it, for Miles. So... And also, but the thing is, you bought it digitally. I was like, just buy the fucking disc so I can borrow it too, you son of a bitch. But, but anyway, I did hear, it, I did want to play it. And I Hey, man, it's home. a fucking pandemic. I wasn't trading off fucking, I wasn't handing things over in the middle of summer this year. Wipe it down with fucking <laughs> disinfectant. It's fine. But no, like, um, and yeah, I heard it was like very well written, like a very good continuation, while not quite as long as maybe big, large, if you will, as the original Marvel Spider-Man. But from all accounts, it's perfectly fine for what it is, and the, like justice and the gameplay is still just as good in the same engine, like you said. So yeah, right on. I do want to play it eventually, though. So I'll move along. Kind of a, okay. Now my number four is in fact Kentucky Route Zero, and I get it. Like, there's not much like in terms of games. Like, it's not even a point and click per se. Like, it it plays like one, but. There's no inventory or anything. It's just like conversations. And like, even then, like you don't really, it's like dialogue options, but I, I, I think I'm going to steal this. I believe this was in the review. It's not like you're influencing the plot or like the decisions of the character per se. It's more like you influence the tone a little bit, but I thought that was really cool. Like, and I thought the writing itself indeed was pretty spot on, pretty top notch. Like it addresses a lot of like interesting and relevant cultural and social like issues like basically kind of like twin peaksy a little bit like in terms of that yeah, like it's, it's just it's like got a lot of hints of thing. like a lot of things like shit like what it tastes like wine like twin peaks for sure a couple other like i had a whole list of stuff um that it sort of feels <clears> like like even night in the woods where like mm. basically uh this weird mysterious company electric company is like taking over everything it's almost like fucking um god this raw shark text where like they go to some weird like like outside the world zone, like sort of like halfway between reality, like Twin Peaks is again. Really cool. And some of the set pieces were pretty sweet. And just it switches characters, like a cast of like seven or eight characters. And it's sort of cut up into like little acts, like little episodes <clears throat> that actually, as a quick fun fact, it actually was released over the course of like eight years. Like the first episode came out in like 2013 on PC. So oh, they, wow. kept rele- they kept releasing like, I think it's seven or eight total. And like, there's also little intermission things which are separate and also very interesting. There's one, there's like, basically you're just like dialing like a, a, an auto, like a menu, a phone menu line. But like, it's so funny and hilarious, like weird about it. Like I, it's one of the standout things for me. It's not even part of the plot per se, but yeah, it was, so it was released over eight, seven, eight years and they collected together in one console edition, which came out in January, like right on the turn of 2020. It's like one of the first games I played. And I just think it's basically my avant-garde indie game of the year, like like, uh, you know, category award for best games because I was quite um, enthralled with it, I, especially again for the writing and just thought it was really cool. 
unique, interesting. Now, sure, not for everybody. And it ain't no Doom for sure. It's like the opposite of Doom in terms of like yeah. hardcore gameplay. But I, will, I do want to give indie studios credit, especially for good writing. And that's what I'm doing here. So, all right. Why don't you move on to your next one? Well, I was going to say, do you want to do your number three? Because I started at four, basically. Sure. So, like, I'll, you know, you you go first and then I'll... I get a free roll? Sure. Well, I mean, we're going to have this... I think we both had this game on our list, but it's the Final Fantasy VII remake. And I sort of shuffled, like, not shuffled, like, early on. And we even did an episode. We were remembered that we don't often do it on games and culture, but we did do an episode purely about uh, our experience and impressions and stuff when... FF7 remake dropped last spring around this time even. So yeah, like I just thought, and as I said then and I'll just quickly say now that I'd never played the original FF7. It was like a gap in my video game <clears> history. <throat> Didn't have the means to play it. So with the remake I was curious to see and I, I even wasn't going to do it at first either but it sort of fell into it. And I, it. I believe it released quickly after Doom so I was like, fine, fuck it. Like I'll get it like whatever. Pandemic is happening now. I Pandemic, man. <laughs> and yeah, I thought like it was a, even though it's like part one, we can like sort of quickly get, mention this, but not get into it too much. It's like not the full story of the, it's like the first section or so of the original FF7, right? In terms of like the whole plot. So, like, technically, they're going to release, you know, part two or like the next section or whatever later on. But I think it is a 50 hour or so, 40, 50 hour experience unto itself that does close off, you know, arc one of the narrative. And the production value is just super fucking high on it, like graphically, voice acting, everything. The story, it, it, it's it's more than fine, really. It's just not like the most amazing shit ever. But gameplay, I thought they updated real nicely the way combat works and all that. And just was a real fun romp with moments of, le you know, a decent amount of moments of levity, but it also got serious when it needed to get serious. And, then, you know, the story was all complete at least that part of it and i thought it was a really good experience totally worth it and i had a good time with it so it's really interesting uh, and, and again i'll talk about this a bit more later because i've got this one for an, probably nostalgia reasons like if i'm being completely honest with myself much higher uh in the no. list but um the 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 next one that's coming out is like an interstitial episode about oh, uh, one of the characters right. that everybody who knows yeah. the original game is going to love like obviously you haven't met this character yet but yeah like it's the character yuffie of is, her. yeah like so yuffie is getting her own uh, like game basically which talks about like her whole backstory which is really fascinating to me like the, the way that they're doing this is really interesting yeah um it's based on un like, untraditional yeah well based on how much i know about the game like they're doing it like so you're like, yeah, the story isn't like the most amazing. And I get that because you've only seen this little bit of it. But like the whole overall thing is going to be so much crazier. <laughs> like, and I'm just sure. like, all right, let's fucking go. And like, I feel like it's gonna be 15 years before this whole fucking thing comes out. But uh, regardless, um, I think you're in for a treat when when you get to the end of the actual story. Um, sure. That being said, my number three, and probably only for nostalgia reasons, is this down to number three, is going to be Ghost of Tsushima. A great game. A fucking fantastic game. Um, loved what it did. It wasn't, <laughs> like, like, the reason it's not higher is because I have so much love for Doom and Final Fantasy, like a little fucking preview of what I'm going to tell you my next two games are. I have such this like huge love for Doom and Final Fantasy, like just from my past and everything, and and it wasn't as good as God of War, right? Like if it was, if it was like as good as as God of War, the most recent God of War that came out, I, I'd be like, all right, it has to be number one. It was but real good, just not as good. Ghost as Ghost was really good, very cinematic, very cool, but it was just. Now, it didn't have like something that gave it the edge over these other two games that like really had a hold on me from the time I was young, like basically. That's so, it. Uh, Ghost is going to be my number three game. Absolutely awesome, like samurai, very, uh, very like old school Japanese cinema style and feel to it. Very cool. The, my my only gripe is like it did a little tiny bit not anywhere near as like uh much as other games that i've had problems with this with but like 
you know my gripe mm-hmm. for like grand theft auto or like red yes Dead yes <laughs> games are always gonna be like all right like i have to do all these fucking side missions and they're all the fucking same so like you like you have to do the same side mission over and over again and it happens in this game too but like Not they kind of cut it off like before it gets like too much so i think that they I think that they found the right balance in this game in terms of the side missions and like doing the same types of side missions again, over and over again, that um, let it be its own thing. Well, like it, this is one of the first games in actually forever that I platinumed because it wasn't that hard to platinum. Right. It was an asshole and about I, it. Exactly. And I loved, and I loved that about it. I was like, okay, I can finish it. Like I finished the game and it was like, all right, you need to do like five more side missions or something like that to actually platinum this game. It's like, all right, done. Like most times I'm like, fuck it. I finished the fucking story. That's all I'm really into the game for. That's all I want. I don't need this fucking side shit. Like I like it Lack while I'm clock. doing it. But like it, when I'm done with the story, I'm good. Uh, this was like, you have a little bit more and then you can platinum the game. I was like, yeah, let's fucking do it. Let's get it. So uh I will give it major props for that. This is the first game in forever that I platinum, including the two games that are going to be higher on the list than this one. So, <clears throat> I feel yeah. Well, a perfect segue again. Just the difference of me having or choosing to vote more time to games than anything else. Ghost is of course my number two game. And again, funnily enough, we did it's along with FF is we did an episode purely about it again when it came out in the summer of, of 2020. And yeah, I think as I said at the time. It's a a unique setting. Like it's it's almost like the joke was that like if the Assassin's Creed game everyone wanted of the feudal Japan uh, period that they did never actually have at least haven't done yet in mm. the actual Assassin's Creed series, and yeah, it's like it's like the perfect anagram. And maybe I'll steal something that I myself did say about um, Horizon Zero Dawn when I had it on my list that year. It takes it distills like a bunch of elements and mechanics that it's not that you haven't seen this shit before in like a third person open world action game. It's just that they streamlined it, like you said, trimmed it down, didn't like overstay its welcome, they didn't repeat the same fucking thing over and over. Like I enjoyed I did do the I did platinum as well, but you know, I probably have an affinity for platinum games a little bit beyond you anyways, as mm-hmm. we've admitted and discussed. But all I'm saying is like, yeah, unique, like they admitted the Kurosawa influence, like there's even a Kurosawa there's other cool filters, like fucking everyone was posting amazing screenshots of this game when it came out because it looks so beautiful. And they have like all these awesome op- options for like photo mode filters and everything <clears throat> and and one of them is in fact kurosawa mode right so it's like black and white like grainy and yeah but yeah the story was characters were pretty damn well done like you know w- well more than competent well more than like serviceable and it was a good story uh nice sort of three arcs that cut off the world into three like bigger like geographically locations right so it's sort of like nicely paced out i think as a uh, it's kind of what we're you want to say there where like it didn't mm. overwhelm you it wasn't like do a thousand races or whatever like shit like that and just it was a good upgrade system too like the fucking fighting style is really cool the gear and all that like was really sweet and yeah like it just took a lot of all these elements that are were known established like perfectly f- found foundational mechanics and put it into a cool world a unique world with cool a good character good stories and did it all really well so yeah for sure go Tsushima spot on yeah all right all right so that's gonna bring it to me with my number two is going to be this guy in my background if you're watching this on youtube doom the doom slayer Uh, eternal is a fucking awesome game and made even better by the two i haven't you know full disclosure i have not finished the second um dlc yet because my controller decided to be a dick wad and uh kind of break on me so i'm mid second uh trade dlc which came out what like a week and a half ago or two weeks ago or something like that about two weeks ago at this point um and uh, you know i i loved it all the way through it's it, it is a great game my biggest gripe is um the they made these like really crazy boss fights in this game where like yeah. the 2016 version didn't really have them and like it's not <clears throat> I, I feel like mean. i feel like doom's not really about that like yeah they'll throw big ass motherfuckers at you every once in a while but they're not really like quote-unquote boss fights they're like all right well welcome to seeing this 
piece of shit later in the game yeah, yeah. like you know like here's here's the here's how we're gonna fucking int- but like you know there, there are these like really in 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 eternal there are these boss fights that are like all right they're certain uh things that you have to like perfect to beat these bosses that don't really like equate to the rest of the game yeah, and it, that kind it, of, know, which, like, which me. isn't the case like in most other circumstances you're, you're yeah. like you no, know, I, I see what you mean. Like, yeah, like it feels as if, especially in the first DLC, I feel like like every level ended with like a more unique-ish boss fight that required very specific things and weapons. Like that wasn't like really the case in yeah. just generally playing through it. So yeah, I feel you on that for sure. But otherwise, it was pretty. Yeah. Great. Otherwise, I fucking I absolutely love the action. I, honestly, if they got rid of the boss fights, this could be almost a perfect game for me. Like, <laughs> um, and and. And well, I, I guess in in I feel like in the second DLC they did kind of nerf the uh, I, yeah I agree. The, what they, the hell is his name the Marauder they toned it down a little bit it seemed like the first DLC was just like fucking hardcore like just insano from the word go yeah but like the the other thing that like a little bit annoys me like I, I get what they're doing but like they keep getting more and more like specific enemies or like there's a specific way to beat this enemy it's like all right now i have to remember like 15 different enemies how to fucking beat them like i just want to be able to like pound the shit out of fucking enemies (laughs) and like with the specific doom moves that i have you know like making these more specific enemies um it's kind of annoying especially the the curse like in in the new dlc there's this curse fucking demon that like can curse you and then you slowly lose health unless you find him and uh blood punch him is the only way to fucking kill him when yeah. like so i'm trying to like shoot him and it's, that doesn't work and it's like i, I don't know that character that enemy was real fucking annoying to me and i'm sure he's going to get more annoying as we go on but um it it is like i i get what they're trying to do i get that they're trying to like keep it interesting yeah they tried to mix it up keep it fresh and like maybe it just you know didn't always 100 yeah. percent work you know didn't always get there because it seemed i agree like it can seem a little that's jar- fine yeah it can seem a little jarring when they throw that kind of stuff and like that isn't really what, what i've trained my you know has have been trained on the rest of the game to deal with yeah in that way like i totally get you but i still thought it was cool like when i mentioned real quick on again on pop culture that the, and there was a really cool set piece i thought in the second part two of the dlc that was like really super epic and like the, the way they did it like the artwork and stuff like what was happening like while you were doing like you're doing your doom thing but like if you just looked out in the distance you're like oh that's really fucking cool yeah. i probably have not gone to that yet right like that's for a little later on i'm in the reclaimed earth section right i think now. it might be after i don't remember but <clears throat> i think you'll know it when you see it but right, um anyways but no yeah doom is a good pick of course and i get it you're, you're nostalgia for it so I guess I'll go to my number one. We, by process of elimination implication, we know what your number one is going to be, but you can speak more about it anyways. But mine might be like possibly I'll get pushback slash contra- like it might be quote controversial. Maybe not. you won't think so, but <clears throat> I'm putting Cyberpunk 2077 as my number one. Now, yes, it was a VR disaster, nuclear launch uh, to start out with. Like it was just horrible. Now and. I will admit, yes, I had crashes, uh, probably like a dozen throughout. Like, it, but it's a long game. It probably, I probably put like seventy hours into it, but it was never <clears throat> enough. Like, yeah, of course that's annoying, and yeah, there were a few small minor bugs, or like some of them, like more hilarious in the sense of like just aesthetically weird. Some of them, like, oh, this quest like didn't quite trigger right, or this item didn't appear, whatever. But there was always a work. I never had a quest breaking or a main story breaking bug at all or if i did have one like the internet had a an easily workable of it where it didn't like halt progress altogether mm-hmm. but like i get it yeah like it and i think as a quick teaser as well i would like to cover that more like the release of it and the fallout from it and all that shit more in depth because yeah they had, to, they had to put out really huge patches and this and that and like in fact as of today i believe they just put out another patch yesterday which I haven't even like. Listen, man, Cyberpunk released in December. Like I, I moved well beyond that. Like unless <laughs> you, you, they, they, ostensibly they're going to put out DLCs for it too, and sure I'll get that. But like I, I'm not going to go back and replay or anything. Like I finished the story, 
and I but the reason I'm putting it at number one is that I did think the story and the characters and like again the production value and the voice work like was interesting and just really worked like Keanu of course is a, a main feature as one of the characters and the way you can like have your character be different skills like of course it, you know again it's not anything you haven't seen before it's almost Witcher like in terms of that just FPS not third person but you know all like I thought the items the gears the way the stat things work like the um array of options like for example I was doing um one of my play styles or one of my specialties was basically like like stealth guns or like sniper rifles and pistols for like a long time about 40 hours into it I found this really awesome katana I'm like you know what I might start re you know putting points or like building up my katana skills my um agility blade skills and that was a completely different way to play it like right so now I'm a melee guy now I'm like sort of like jumping down from rooftops like fucking katana motherfuckers in the face like it's different and like there's all this hacking system too too you can like hack enemies in various ways like do different things to them make them turn against each other uh turn their guns off like make their guns jam like there's just a lot of cool little options as well as little awesome moments that are sprinkled throughout some of the um more elaborate grander set pieces that just i was invested in the story from start to finish and the writing like constantly kept itself up so i don't know what to say for me like first person rpgs are like my you know my bread and butter jam pretty much and yes this game had a lot of hype and what happened happened but for me personally my experience uh i'm putting at number one with the only the only thing i have in my notes is that it in ghost in theory or like Ghost was number one for a very long time because Ghost dropped in the summer. <clears throat> Cyberpunk, like I said, didn't drop till mid December. And, you know, again, it was pushed back, blah, blah, blah. But it's a very close horse race. It's like by a nose, probably, is Cyberpunk winning it. But, you know, so I'm just saying number one and number two are quite close. But technically, at the end of the day, photo finish, Cyberpunk 2077 takes it for me for game of the year. So Fair enough. I've, come I've, at me with comments or whatever. Uh, if you're listening to this, like, fine, I'll be happy to discuss it. But just saying my experience of it, sure, had technical hitches, was annoying, was grating. I was like, fuck you, like cursing out my TV. But when I was playing it, when everything was clicking, it was pretty phenomenal. So despite that, still a number one game in the year. So I, I mean, I, I, I do want to play that game. And, and I'm looking forward to if I or like when I get to it being uh a less glitchy uh experience for in me, theory so. it should be much smoother for you sure <clears throat> i i i think that that'll be pretty cool um my number one game we've already i mean i've already said all of my games in this list and and you may know it by now if you've been paying attention if you haven't it is final fantasy 7 remake um i absolutely love this game and yes 100% I will say it got boosted a lot by nostalgia. Sure. I loved Final Fantasy 7. The original is probably my favorite game of all time. You claim it to be like, your favorite game, yes. Yeah, I, up there with like Metal Gear Solid, the original Metal Gear Solid and like mm. I like make, maybe Chrono Trigger is like in that realm or like Half-Life 2 uh but it <clears throat> it is like the original game is up there with those all-time greats and the fact that they did that justice even in this like small fraction of the total game mm. <clears throat> is really impressive to me and i think that i think that they did a good job fleshing out some of the things that you didn't get fleshed out in the original game sure. so that's what i I've heard <laughs> yeah i mean i i love and and scott you're getting a more complete version of the final like final fantasy 7 world like of midgar um and you know, like next, we're going outside of Midgar. So, like, you know, you're gonna get the Yuffie game. I assume you're gonna play that, and then well, part two. I can't yet still because it's PS5 only. As like the the sort of thing. You I don't think it's just... coming out for a little while, anyways. But um, I thought it's coming out soon. I actually don't know, but oh, sure, it, I, I, it might it might be. But regardless, I would like to play it when it does. But I believe it's only a PS5 version. Yeah. As of regardless, this. once part two comes out i'm very excited for that and specifically because uh if anything gets like short shrift in this fucking game it's red the red 13 uh who is the you know like wolf dog 
monster hyena guy camaro or whatever <laughs> mutant character and he's fucking awesome and the fact that he was unplayable in the first part of this game was yeah. like i i would hurt me because he was he was a important part of my crew when i played final fantasy 7 sure. like right you get to choose who your three characters are that you're playing at any given time and like i ran with him a lot so like uh i am looking forward to him being a playable character and to wow. getting more into all of the characters as we go on um you did get the you did get the uh you know, like all, all of the, all the early, I, I don't want to go into spoilers here because this is a very like just general episode, but like you did get a lot of the, you hit the points that you needed to hit in Final Fantasy seven, but they hmm. also did an amazing job of like turning what you expect. If you played the original, it turning what you expect on its head a bunch of times and like, just making little changes or even kind of big changes, but explaining why they're changing. And sure. like, that's what I heard. Um, yeah. But then impressions that. about that were I like, I mean, you know, you, Sky, you, you know what happens. Like there's points where you're trying to do something and there's this for to not be spoiler. There's this force that stops you from doing the things that actually happened in the first game and like things like that. So like, there's this really cool way that they, uh play with the canon and like mess around with like uh inverting what happens in the canon so that's why final fantasy 7 remake is my number one game of the year had a bunch of fun playing it played it all the way through and um looking forward to the rest of it oh which i was <clears throat> i was actually kind of furious when they first announced this that it was they were like all right we're gonna make it a bunch of games but after playing through this first one hopefully they can keep up the high level of yeah. uh excellence that they showed in the first game so now i'm with you and i think as you said like i believe their plan is to release more episodes more often so like maybe slightly smaller slices but at least to get you to you know keep the story going yeah. etc i feel you but yeah so red 13 is your boy and he, he's a cool character and like i just i don't have well, to... wait until you actually get to know yeah. him better you know like you, sure. you're we're, we're gonna go to like into his uh, origins in the next one, I assume. Like if <laughs> if it's following kind of kind of the way that roughly the original, yeah, yeah sure. you'll get to see like his hometown and stuff, and like get a lot of his origins and things like that. So it's it's really cool. Word. All right, FF seven number one for you. Totally respectable. Well, I guess that's all your game. So I'll just try to rattle off. That's a bunch it. Of I'm stuff done. Here. I'm almost I'm almost about to like go get myself another drink while you go on about your next thing and then oh, come back. Cool man. You. Just leave me here by myself. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You're a great friend. Um anyways, but yeah, so I mean I do honorable mention, so I'll go on to that. Now I tried to keep some I I didn't have any ties this year on, on top games, and I tried to avoid it because the one year everyone was like, What the fuck? <laughs> you get to have like ten games on your top five? I'm like, okay, okay. But <laughs> I do have a few ties throughout the rest of the categories and I will try to justify them when they come up. But so now we're just doing it in order. So number one honorable on my list is a game called Wasteland three, which is from my, uh, my dudes, a studio I like called in exile who did um, my torment tides of Numenera. One of the games I love a lot in recent memory. They do basically do old school CR like top down, like hardcore stats and stuff. And, I bought, I remember buying the remaster, the director's cut or whatever of Wasteland 2 a couple years ago and like liking it and like, and they're doing a Wasteland 3 and like, sweet. And I just think it's an improvement in almost every way. Like, it's just, it continues the story and the characters a bit. Like, you don't have to necessarily have played 2, but if you did, you get a little bit more out of it. But there's like a good recap or whatever, and it's like a new set in a new area, but it ties into some they, general plot elements and stuff that was set up in 2. But I just think it's a cool, and they added some, like, for example, you now can go around the um, the world map with, like, a little tank, like, essentially, like, a big, like, a kill dozer, like, more or less, and you can, like, upgrade that. It has its own stats and stuff, and <laughs> when you get into fights, like, it can be part of your team. Like, you can command it to, like, shoot things or run over guys. So it's, it's turn-based combat, so, you, you know, you have a little party, and, like, yeah, you build up different stats. You can have, like, your sniper guy or, like, your sniper lady or whoever you want. Like, um, you can create your own character, and then you meet kind of, like, standard, like, you know, 
RPG stuff. You meet different characters throughout, and you have a, I think, a four or five person limit team, so you can switch them out. You're like, okay, this this character is better at has better like uh, explosion stats or whatever explosive mm. stats. So like, th- they'll be my rocket launcher person, and like this person is better stealth or whatever. So, and it's just a really cool. Like, it had fun moments as well. Like, it's again the dark humor, the writing is like basically why I like an exile quite a bit because it's it's almost fallout or at least a lot of so just real quickly a lot of some of the studio especially um brian fargo is his name he's the head or like the head director lead director of creativity whatever creative director he was part of the original team who did the original fallout one and twos right and so like then the company split up blah 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 blah. so he formed an exile and they've basically been sort of doing that ever since like with so it's like top down uh yeah it's like top down isometric style. isometric yeah yeah so like you know you go around different areas and you explore and then you might get into a battle with some raiders or ravengers or whatever like and the, um there are some I, again to your point i don't want to like spoil any moments because i think it, you just might as well experience them but there again there are some funny darkly funny stuff that in the vein of the fallout humor like post apoc ish world that like just very surprising and very fun and very cool as well as having like a mass like you could be having a massive battle but like the reason you're having it and like who you're having it with is uh, very amusing yeah so like there's that and like just yeah little small quality of life improvements like the way that armor works and stuff like again little little things along the way that just streamline some of the more rougher edges from two and a full complete story for the soundtrack which is so fucking amazing and I don't have her name. I have it in my full notes. I just didn't jot it, sorry, didn't jot it, jot it down here, but I do want to give her credit. I think she's Quentin Tarantino's music editor, like music consultant. So there's it's like a lot of covers and like awesomely done ones, like speakers and like the theme from Green Acres that is and fucking um everybody wang chung tonight, like shit like that. Like the whole soundtrack is fucking fantastic and you can listen to the radio while you're driving around and uh and it, a lot of it matches to the set pieces like certain set piece battles and encounters and stuff and just like it surprised the hell out of me like very pleasant i'm like holy crap i think it's just like the icing on the cake if you will like on top of all the improvements gameplay wise and even story wise the soundtrack is so fitting and so awesome that it just it adds another layer and is really really great in combination so i just looked it up for you uh, mary ramos yes Thank known you. as her <clears throat> known for her work as quentin tarantino's music, music supervisor yeah yeah so like you know if you like you know how tarantino has his like sometimes obscure sometimes known like you know like the basically reservoir dogs here i am stuck in the middle set to that scene it's like stuff like that so yeah. i'm just saying it, it it's awesome that they had her like as doing that because it really does add a lot to the way they've the songs they've chosen, the way they've chosen to do the covers, like in this, like a country cover of something that isn't a country song, you know, right? And then set to the actual narrative events and encounters that you're doing. So it's got a big shout out, and that's why it's number three. It's just an improvement in almost every way and a really solid as hell CRPG. Alrighty, so here's my first tie. At number two, I've got Cloudpunk and Ghost Runner. And here is why they're cyberpunk themed setting at least set in a cyberpunk ish world uh and but they're also like sort of diametrically opposed in terms of how like the gameplay <laughs> works so cloud yeah. punk I, it was a pc game uh and they ported it later on in the year in 2020 and i was sort of like i kind of slept on, i feel like it's a sleeper hit they both kind of are but cloud punk more so and after i was playing it i i said to people um the way to describe it would be like it's this year's night in the woods it's basically like sort of Blade Runner slash GTA ish where you're just you're just sort of flying a car around in a futuristic city. The art style is voxel art. So it's really, really cool. Like a noir city like a giant city in the clouds like built up so high. You're flying around skyscrapers and shit. Like basically you're like an Uber driver or like a delivery driver. Half half Uber, half delivery driver. Like you're either delivering packages or sometimes taking on passengers. And it's just like the settings, the, the story starts to unfold more and more. Like at first, it seems kind of disjointed, like you're just doing this. But they have a really, I think, the way they do the world building, how it suddenly builds, and like you suddenly start making connections between what you did in this mission two missions ago, two assignments ago, right? So they're voiced. 
It's just that you're just flying around. And then you can also, you can get out of your car and walk around and explore the city. Like, you'll know, buy a thing, like find items here and there. So it's not just flying around, although for the most part it is, but you can mm-hmm. park, you know, at certain locations and then sort of explore the city and just, yeah, the art, the visuals, excuse me, I thought like very impressive. Like they're not, I don't want to say lo-fi, it's just voxel art. So it looks, it almost looks like a, a noir of cyberpunk city built of Legos. Like that's the best way I can describe it. I watched, I watched you play some of this game and it almost felt like, um, like a journey like type kind vibe. Of, yeah. Like just very chill, like fucking, yeah. you know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the same thing by any means, but it like had that kind of vibe of like, this game is fucking chill. Like you just fucking wander around the city in this like kind of rainy yeah. cyberpunk future in this that flying is- car and like, that's kind of it. Like it, it, it looked cool. It looked very yeah. relaxing. Well, you said that's kind of it, but like, unlike yeah. the other game you're about I'm to talk had, about, I think that <laughs> a substantial story, like a meaningful story with characters who are again like sort of ex. Like basically, you're a female. Um, she's like 20 years old, and she's just come to the city and is like trying to make ends meet. And she's also like, it's it's implied like she's almost an ex for like a Middle Eastern refugee. So like she might be Islamic, like something like that. Like it's never outright said, but it's very heavily implied and in tone. And like it's sort of her dealing with like that and also just being a woman. Like you get harassed in the street by a bunch of like asshole punks. She's like, Yeah, like I haven't heard that one before, right? It's like she like this is su- surprising, yeah. like really well dropped in little moments like that. And yeah, if I, I a good reminder, I meant to mention it on the outset, but I try to also have a theme like in general for this year's games, like all of them. This year, it's it's soundtracks, soundscapes, because yes, the final thing is the fucking soundtrack to Cloudpunk is so good. It's just very super synth wavy, chill. Like I, I listened to it a lot after this after I played it, and it was just very awesome to just relax to. It's very soothing, calming. Like it's the perfect soundtrack to fly around a rainy, like you said, cyberpunk noir city, like and just have it play. Like mm. it matches so well. So yeah, still not on the opposite end, Ghost Runner is a first per- it's like basically ninja gaiden in first person it's fucking ridiculous it's super twitchy like twitchy like, as fuck yeah. from what i saw like so yeah. it's you have to you have like a couple abilities like you're running off walls and you have a, you only have katana and guys are like shooting at you and stuff and it's one hit kills it's like hotline miami almost as well in first person like one hit kills on you one hit kills on them you die boom press x to respawn instantly there's no load time it's a boom do it you fucked up now do it again right so like sort of got to learn the levels like the layouts are real nice the level design is pretty cool so like for example you do some you do a fucking flip do a wall run then you bounce off then you drop down on the guy then you deflect the bullet back at another guy like whatever it's just super fast paced like yeah you, you might have to learn some patterns like okay i know this guy's gonna come here it's like sort of some you can have some trial and error in it but i just think like if you want like hardcore and like ninja gaiden uh cyber cyborg ninja flip outs like that's basically like what it is <laughs> It's pretty short too. It's yeah. probably like eight, ten hours. They both are like roughly the you know, at max. I would say each game has took me about ten hours, maybe a little more because I'm you know I dick around. But um, just yeah, like and the story, this Ghost Runner is like okay, it's sort of standard cyberpunk and stuff. It's like it's not as interesting or nuanced as Cloudpunk, but it does use a lot of cyberpunk tropes in general. And uh, yeah, just like I think 10, 10, 12 levels, something like that. And there's like a boss every three levels, like sort of a puzzle boss or. One of them, for example, Steve O, it's like this giant like tower cannon thing. There's always lasers coming around. And, like you gotta like wall run, you gotta like duck, dodge, jump, like double jump over this laser and then sl- go slide under this one and get to the top of the tower and fight it. And it's like really yeah. cool. So yeah, it it can be twitchy. It's almost doom like where like you just gotta be fucking you know always be moving. Yeah, exactly, like pretty much. But you can learn some of the um patterns and whatever. So I I like them both and I like I said, I think they're both good cyberpunk games. You want something more chill, you want interested in more um, narrative style and laid back, check out Cloudpunk. You just want to go like super twitched, destroy, uh, be an, again, cyborg ninja and destroy other punk, futuristic punk thugs, check out Ghost Runner. So I think they're both can have a possibility of being like cult status, like hidden gems. Like I think 10 years from now, people will be like, Yo, Cloudpunk is a hidden gem. Like, oh, like I don't think they they had gotten okay reception, but not great reception. Mm-hmm. But I think they are under the radar, like solid. So, those are my number two ties on honorable. And I'll just move on to number three, 
This is one that almost jostled with Doom a little bit, Steve-O, but I thought a bit about it a bit more. It's the Resident Evil 3 make, remake, RE3 make, if you will, slash Nemesis. Yeah. And like, it was good. I had a good time with it. It was solid as hell. It just, I just thought it wasn't as top notch as the two make was. And also, like, there was like criticism about it. A lot of it was like, it felt as if it were like almost like DLC for two and not a full game unto itself, which I think is fairly valid to an extent. Like, yeah, I kind of agree at the end of the day. It was still cool. I guess my biggest gripe is that like it played well with the same engine, right? So, like, look real slick and you're, you're, you're Jill now and you're going through and like, the whole draw is like nemesis is supposed to chase you down like in the original game he never stops like stalking you and this in the way they did it here is like he only stalks you for certain points of it so like that pressure like is somewhat removed which is like i guess your mileage might vary whether you think that's a good or a bad thing i thought it was fine i thought it would have been cool if indeed he was stalking me the whole time but when went the, at the portions that he did show up i'm like yeah it's harrowing like you you got to figure it out nemesis is going to be on your ass like yeah. whatever and you have a battle with him of course and like he <clears throat> becomes more and more grotesque and elaborate every time that happens and like whatever it's like it, it was fine but yeah it's just that it wasn't quite up to snuff way that two was so i decided to bump it down to honorable i had to stop playing too because it got too intense for me when mr x <laughs> showed up but oh well i feel like i should get back to that at some yeah. point and ostensibly just, like, power through it you should. You definitely finished two. You can probably skip three of you personally, but yeah. I still liked it. I had a good time with it. In fact, I platinumed it because, again, this is uh, maybe a double-edged sword complaint where, in calling back to the order you mentioned, it's probably like a six to seven hour like campaign for RE3. So like, you can burn through it fairly fast. But I started, you know, then I did all like um, bumped up the difficulty and like did mm. some of the things like don't, you know, don't open the item box or don't use healing things or whatever. So like, but because it's so short, like you can sort of, you know, do playthroughs of it and yeah, whatever. It was fun. I enjoyed doing about six playthroughs of it on each different level or like, you know, doing a different achievement each time after the first initial playthrough. So it's solid as hell. All right. So number four, another tie real quick. And I think these are two games you're going to be completely unfamiliar with because they're indie-ish under the radar. In fact, I snuck them in because... Shout out to my friend Michael Geronda, who gave me a fucking Xbox Series S for Christmas, like out of the blue. So now I have Game Pass. So it was one called Haven. It came out in December of 2020. So it was pretty late, like snuck in the end of the year. And uh, it's a really cool, almost like hand, not hand drawn, like, like cell shaded art style. And it's almost like a love story. Like, again, it's very chill. The soundtrack is very, very cool. Check it out too. Almost on par with Todd Punk. And you're, you're a young couple on an alien planet who's who's like basically escaped it's almost like fucking um god hunger games or something where like they escape like an oppressive government planet whatever and like you know they're 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 not married but they're in love and they're trying to like get uh live their own life on a different planet and uh <laughs> sounds like saga. yeah you kind of like and it kind of is actually not you mentioned it but yeah like and so like the cool thing about it is it's in third person and it's sort of like an RPG light, or at least JRPG, where for the most part, you're sort of really cool, like gliding around this planet, like the way it, you have like basically hover boots. So like the movement is really slick, really smooth, really fun to control. Just sort of fuck around with like, you know, just explore, pick up resources. And then every once in a while, you run into a monster and it turns into a turn based like thing. But the, the main mechanic gimmick is that like, because you're a couple, if you choose the right moves at the right time or like, all right, my wife or you know my girlfriend is gonna do this move first, and then uh, the boyfriend does this move, and like if you time them and combo them right, it does like you know super huge damage or like stuns the monster or whatever. Like there's some kind of bonus benefit, and like it's pretty cool. Like if you do it right in tandem, you know like it's it's supposed to like feed into the fact of like they're a like, young couple in love, and I thought like the story's pretty good too because it's it can be like. Some moments can feel like a little over saccharin, I guess, right? Like mm. it's a little too like lovey dovey, but then you get into like a fight or a tiff and like it feels sort of down to earth where like these characters feel real. They feel like they know each other and yes, are in love, but they're not just like one dimensional, one sided. We're like, they're like, hey, we're disagreeing here. Like let's yeah. try to work through it. You know, like I'm mad at you, but let's talk about it. And now let's do, let's go to the next part of section of the planet and figure this out. Right. So it's pretty cool. And I, I thought it was a neat. A uh, little game again, indie game under the radar that I sort of got in like last minute under the buzzer and checked out, and it was pretty cool. So tied with that uh, is a game called Falconeer, 
which I described as you, you like the never ending story. You kind of want to play a game which in which you ride not you don't ride around on Fal Fangor or Falcor or whatever, but you do ride around on a giant falcon and uh, in third person. And like the, again, the art style is not the same as Haven, but it's a little it's got a very cool almost watercolor uh, feel design to it. And yeah, like you you upgrade your falcon again, like you get different weapons, different abilities, and it has only it's a, it's set in a unique cool world. I th I thought. And it's it's not like huge. It's like it's got an open. It's got a map to it, but it, you know, it's not anywhere near as massive as AAA games would be. Right. But it's like it feels big enough. Like the areas feel distinct, and there's a a story to it. There's like four chapters. Probably took me 15 hours, roughly again, to play. And I platinumed it. Or there's no platinums on um an Xbox, but I did all the achievements, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> And yeah, it was just really cool. Like just you, fl uh, you fly around on the Falcon and like have dog fights with other like enemy riders of falcons and like fucking sea monsters and stuff like like giant sea enemy pirates. Crabs? Yeah, no, there is a giant enemy crab. There indeed is, and I was waiting for to say that. Like, Amazing. yeah, like there's like a, a a giant enemy crab. It's almost like a crab tank where like it's got organic and half you know biological or <laughs> no, half mechanical, half biological. Can you flip it over and attack its weak point? No, you just sort of like you just sort of bomb it or shoot its like you know smokestack, shoot its guns yeah, and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but no, like I thought it has a it had a really cool like unique lore to it, like a, a whole world that was set up and like with its own backstory and like you uncover more of it. And again, you go around like doing little missions for different factions. Again, a very rich, deep history to this fictional world that I thought was really neat. Like a lot of work clearly went into it. And yeah, flying around the Falcon was fucking cool because there's different kinds of um like elemental you can like do fire damage or lightning damage whatever and you're just like your falcon you're just like shooting from like a rifle on the back of your falcon doing like doing barrel rolls like for sure like right <laughs> do a barrel roll. it's like, it's almost like star fox too like you know it's yeah. falcon fox or whatever star falcon really <laughs> but it's super fun and just like was just long enough without being too little or too much and again unique cool story setting and gameplay was was tight like do having dog fights or again like there's pirate ships too it's almost like steampunky really is like kind of the way the world is so like they got ships coming at you and you, you dive bomb them or you, you can like pick up bombs and drop them while you're while and then you're getting har harassed by like other again falcon riders serpent riders like sea snake riders and shit so it's really cool and i do recommend it and i uh the one shout out i gotta say i believe it was like basically one person one guy did almost all the artwork programming and stuff development on it so pretty impressive on that front so i gotta give a shout out to that i don't have his name sorry but it is a really cool game especially given the for the fact that it was one guy all right so number five real quick i rattle off of games i played this year um got what it's uh Watch Dogs legion which was kind of a romp it's almost like a a guy richie felt like like it felt more they didn't take itself too seriously. It, yeah. I think it is the Batch Watch Dogs. It's the third one now at this point. And the whole gimmick is like, any, there's no like main character. Like you just recruit people, citizens on the street, and they have different abilities like this and that, blah, blah, blah. And like you can level them up and stuff. And like, it's super British. Like it's always like, over the top of, oh, fucking hell, mate. Like, and it's like, <laughs> but it's, it's also set, like an Orwellian, like, like, like a PMC essentially works with the corrupt British government to like, you know, uh, survey and establish, you know, watching everybody like and monitoring them and basically secret policing them away. If you step out of line and it's basically you and your hacker group trying to undo it all and trying to expose their corruption. And yeah, it was, it basically plays like GTA, like the other ones, like third person, like action, like whatever cool skills, like each person, like for example, some people are better at hacking or some people can't use guns or won't use certain guns or whatever. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, you want to fill out your crew with a nice rounded, rounded out like array of people who, each mission might require this or that. So like, whatever. And it was just a lot of fun, like a super fun British romp. Like, you know, it was a roll in the park, mate, a, a right lovely lock or whatever. Like, <laughs> I remember you playing the first one of that. Like, I mean, I feel like we did that on this very show. Yep. Like when you played I mentioned it, one, like, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was wondering like what kind of, if it would become like a series. So I guess it has, <laughs> I mean, like, I think, you know, it's not as long standing. Of course, it started way later than Assassin's Creed, but like, I think Ubi is trying to make it like an ongoing franchise for Almost sure. It's like, uh, Saint, what is it, Saints Row or whatever? Yeah, like, yeah, like kind of. Yeah. But no, I mean, it was a lot of fun again because, because you know, I like the British culture in general and just like mm -hmm. it was set in London. So 
it was the you know, open world map of London. And you're just at least sections of it, uh, if not the whole thing, but whatever. Like, and like, so that means they had the real landmarks. You can go to Big Ben, you can go to like the Ferris wheel and all the other famous ish stuff from Britain and fuck around with it, hack them all, blow them all up, whatever, and <laughs> do a bunch of missions. So, right on a drone, I like, guess, really fun to do. So, yeah, it was, it was a romp. So, that's a good lead in because that's my honorable. So, I'll just go to mid tier. Number one on mid tier is another quick tie, but it's AC Valhalla. That's his kid Valhalla. Was his, that's good. <laughs> And like it was okay. It, it was fine. It actually did have a couple bugs and crashes as well, which I don't think I've remember seeing that in uh, an AC game previously. So like I was like, that's weird. Like, how do they manage to like have issues with an AC game like, at this point? Like, given it's usually this, pretty good about that. Yeah. Type given of it's stuff, like nothing else. Uh... Yeah, given it's like the thirtieth <laughs> one. Like I've never seen an AC game crash on me ever. But I don't know. It also was set in um like Dark Age Britain, so you know, England in like the 800s, you're a Viking coming over. And like, I thought it was a pretty good story, like solid enough, but the game is tied with it too, which was fine. It was good. And again, everyone oh, knows. One? I'm sorry. What's it tied it, with? AC Valhalla is tied with Last of Us 2. Okay. So like everyone knows my gripes about Last of Us in general. Like I just think everyone seems to think, and it itself, the game itself and the writers and developers seem to think it's deeper than I seem to think it is. Like revenge is bad. Don't do it okay <laughs> gotcha <laughs> fine like yes and I, I think here it is it's that the reason they're tied at mid-tier salad and the reason i bumped out uh ac sort of jostled but i decided on watchdogs instead is that they're good but they each have their own specific self-indulgent wankery to them essentially like <laughs> sure. ac for how is a little too too long uh same thing last of us like they could have ended it like at certain points it, like it just dragged on i was like you didn't need to have it be this like whatever but it was fine. They were fine in general. It was they were fun to play. I just felt like they got bloated in the way that almost Red Dead Two was kind of bloated as my big gripe about that one. So that's why I bumped them down to honorable. All right. So then I got a couple more smaller ones. So number two, I got a Metamorphosis, which was an adaptation of Kafka's story. It was sort oh, yeah, of that's a, right. a walking simish thing. It was like and Metamorphosis itself, like sort of at the same time, like you played from the perspective and, and first person from like a bug. So like everything was huge, you know, like desks and lamps and stuff, whatever. And like, you're falling through the story of your friend, Joseph K who's going through the trial. And it was like <laughs> really neat idea. Like, you know, it wasn't anything crazy, but it was a real cool, again, also had its own unique art style to it. Real fun. And just, again, how many games use fucking Kafka as their fucking like framework, whatever. And like, granted, sure. That means it's probably a bit nicher, but, it essentially is a walking sim in terms of genre, and you know I like those. And yeah, of course, I was like, yeah, let me. It was probably like twenty bucks. It was cheap enough. I was like, yeah, checking out this Kafka game, like in, from again, small studio, small dev, and the writing was, you know, had some quirky fun. You know, it, it had the moments of weird bureaucratic absurdity that Kafka is, of course, known for. And sometimes you're like playing through it as a bug. Like, oh, it's it's pretty neat. Okay. It was a good it was a good take on it. So I got that. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Uh I'm yeah. glad you liked it. I thought you did play that, or I thought I tried to convince you to no, play it. No, yeah, yeah I, I never got to it, but I was like, that was one of the games where I was like, maybe I'll check this yeah. out, but I never actually jumped on it. Anyway, so yeah, so I have it tied with, sorry, quick tie again, but I see these are all ties. One through four on mid-tier is tied. Men of Warfare is tied with something called Call of the Sea, which is another walking sim. That's why I have it lumped together. Like walking sim, puzzler-ish kind of, which, and not using Kafka, but it's loosely ish based on lovecraftian lore so it's like you go to a mysterious island in search of your missing husband and you're trying to figure out what happened to his expedition and the you know, weird eldritch stuff is happening on the island and like, you solve a bunch of puzzles and it's pretty cool like it was also on um one of the game pass games on an early one for xs so it also came out like right at the end of uh december of 2020 so i snuck that one in as well right after i got my xbox and yeah it was cool another like both of them probably like even less time like six seven hour experiences and that's pretty spot on like that's all really you need and i thought they were both well done with again solid to decent writing and you like some walk sims you want you want to do a kafka walk sim check out meta you want to do a lovecraft walk sim check out call the scene <laughs> sure. fine all right so now moving on to the retro stuff is so we got a uh, my jam blow two which is sort of like the the tie-in to the main Bloodstained game, but it's old school 8-bit style, like, you know, side-scroller Castlevania, pretty much, 
without calling itself Castlevania. And yeah, I think two was like a little bit better. Like again, the the eight bit pixel art is super crisp. Like it and the, the gameplay is really really tight. Like it's old school. Like do a platform, like fight these monsters who are assholes. Like if but if you do it right, like you have you switch off characters real quick. Like you have two or three characters, whatever to choose from. And I think I did a couple playthroughs like on harder difficulty. Like the endings, of course, are different. Or like you can choose not to get your companions and then do it solo, and like slightly changes the ending, whatever. Mm. It's probably like a two to three hour experience as well, like to go through it. So I did a couple playthroughs. It's a small game, you know, twelve bucks. I think it cost me like you know it's priced ap- appropriately. So that was I fine. But yeah, the first one, which was fun, but like yeah. I never got all the way through it. Yeah, I think it was like pretty much on par if not a little better again small tweaks to it that like a little bit better and there was one part at the end it reminded me it was almost like out of nowhere to a degree where it's no longer castlevania 2d style like for plot reasons you basically fly a spaceship to the moon and uh, <laughs> sure. it's almost like 1942 like you're it's basically like gradius like you're fighting in the spaceship now oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like, you do that level and then you go back like the final level is back to normal side scroller but <laughs> sort of like the filler level and then you're like wow this is different right that's funny. So tied with that is a game that I, I wanted to check out for a while. I knew about it, but it was going to be Microsoft exclusive, and I didn't know I was going to be gifted, uh, luckily, you know, fortunately, a, an Xbox. It's called Carrion, where basically you like the Thing movie. Like, it's a horror-ish thing. It's also retro-style 16-bit and kind of Metroidvania as well. You play as a tentacled, batooth tentacled monster, like amorphous <laughs> blob. And the point is to break out, like they have you trapped in the facility in the in the science lab, and you're breaking out of the lab and like trying to escape it, like going through like the military bunkers and all this shit, and like you gain you know you gain more abilities as a monster. So now you can like uh, squeeze through little entrances and like sort of morph yourself into a little ball and like go through this and that, right? So like yeah. you upgrade that way, and that's how you explore the levels, and like, you fight um you know humans who are shooting at you with different like electrical weapons some guys have shields blah 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 like but yeah it's really cool like you're just a big monster and like you grab out your tentacles sometimes when you upgrade enough you can like eat three humans at once you grab them all and eat them whatever like it's really cool and like the art again art style is sweet and basically again a small shorter ish metrovania experience and i wanted to check it out for a while and i was thankful that i was able to do so because yeah i think it's pretty neat and it, it feels like a little ni- again a little niche there but if you enjoy it, if it sounds cool, like look up, look just look up some uh, screenshots and stuff of it. Cause yeah, I like cool. the I like the kind of reversal of the yeah. what you would expect. Like yeah. you are the monster now. Exactly <laughs> right. Like I thought it was a yeah. neat premise, and yeah, it's pretty neat to check out as well. All right, moving along, moving along. Food uh, category award as a tie. I had them separately, but I said like they they might as well be the same thing. So I got Man Eater and Zombie Army Four. Like mm. they were both. Pretty, I would say Man Eater is like a slightly spicier junk food meal, if you will. Like, you know, it's like the Taco Bell versus McDonald's or something like that. Like, <laughs> that is a metaphor. Like, they were very enjoyable while I played them. And then I sort of forgot about them until I was making the list. Like, Man Eater, you're a shark and you go, like, Chris Parnell voices as if it were like a nature documentary, but you yeah, are the yeah. shark, like, a la <laughs> Carrion. Like, so again, you upgrade, like, eat, eat people, or you have fights with, like, for example, a giant sewer alligator, of course. And, like, you get more um you you can mutate yourself to like be a crazy like prehistoric shark and it's just follow along the story and like other shark hunters will come down and hunt you and that's part of the story and like whatever like, it was just fun like and chris parnell was like doing deadpan stuff like the whole time like it actually has a pretty good like environmentalist message to it where like you go to like a golf course it's like this used to be beautiful sea now white people come here all, all the all day every day and, and you know, like whatever like it's like they, they have like snarky little things like that thrown in so it's fun to play and zombie armor uh, uh, zombie army 4 kind of the same thing like it's fine it's almost left for deadish in third person like i played it solo of course but it's kind of meant to be played in groups but zombie hitler is back and he's back from hell and now go to hell and kill him do it like you know fight him like whatever it's fine the, yeah. i think the most uh what encapsulates most is like about 80 percent through like you know you're fighting through like of course it's building up to go fight hitler and his like magical fortress his bunker fortress set with the portal to hell and like you get a radio call it's like hey don't forget to kill hitler and like i'm on it like this is the whole fucking game <laughs> has been that like i just thought it was like a funny little like yeah. yes thank, thank you for that line i got you but yeah again it was sniper it's a sniper elite engine pretty much because it's like a spinoff from that studio 
and they've done it before too. They've had other zombie army games, but this is like a full length one. The others were DLCs. So yeah, again, it was a fine experience, fun to go through, like whatever. So finally, number five on mid tier is a game called Spirit Fair, which I tried to sneak in as well. I got like kind of high praise. It's almost like a farming sim, but framed around like the art. The art style for this one is very cool. It's almost Cuphead-y, Steve, like Cuphead-ish, mm-hmm. like almost old school Disney, like 1920s, 30s uh, style of that. Right. And uh, it's it's not like necessarily my cup of tea. That's why I have it at number five. I feel like your mileage might vary. I like the story setup, like the characters. You're essentially um, I got a, a young woman, like 20 years old, I would assume, like a, a youngerish woman who has become the new Caron, that is to say the new fairy person to the dead, to dead souls, souls crossing over. But in order to do that, and it's all anthropomorphic. So like you find a person, you, it's an openish world map. You sail around, you find people, you get them on your boat, and then like they transform to like, an old, there's one character who's an old grandmother and she's like an old little possum. She's like very slowly moving around like boat. Sure. There's another like uh, a teacher, an art teacher, who was like a, a snake in a, a, a robe. So she's, she's like doing her like artwork, whatever. And like, it's just, you do little tasks for them, but it's like a farming sim. You're on a big houseboat and like, okay, build a, um, you know, a plantation for uh, growing crops and then build a fucking windmill so you can like uh, do, get flour, then build a motherfucking, um, what else? A, a forge and stuff like that, right? Build a lumber mill and like you get all your resources and then you run them through and like the people want you to build them, you know, Hey, can hey, I'd like a picture of my family in my house. Can you go build that? And then you got to go find the materials for that. <laughs> and then like it, it advances the story. It unlocks like more of the world, and you explore more characters and you upgrade. So like that's sort of the core loop. And like yeah, it, it can get like a little like grindy, like repeating. Like it's just like a bunch of like chores and tasks. But I was um, kind of drawn along by the narrative. Now by the end of it, I was like, you know what? I could do more of it. Like I finished the story, and like, and the game shifts you back to like, um, if you, any of the people you had in your boat that you didn't do, like, hey, why don't you do those ones? I'm like, nah, I got like the main story, like it's fine. <laughs> but it was yeah. kind of fun. Like I did find myself falling into a routine. Like, okay, yeah, I want to upgrade. You know, I want to be able to smelt iron now, iron ore and aluminum ore or whatever. And like, again, cool little art style and a neat little world setup and cool to check out. It just can be a little grindy. All right, so that's all the good stuff. So I know we're going long, so let me just fire out. Now it's time, of course, as traditionally, your shit's fucking weak. So I'll just spit out the shit's weak shit's stuff. Weak. All right, so oddly, they're all basically indie horror slash psych thrillers, like whether first person or not. But they're all, and like, you know me, like I try to capitalize stuff. on the good games of yesteryear. That yeah, I guess. Put out a bunch of trash this year, I guess. Yeah. Like, you know, I enjoy my horror stuff. So, like, all the every time everyone that came out, I'm like, yeah, I'm excited for it. You got RE in there, and then everything else is yeah. just not great. And then, sort of like the garbage games, I guess. But so, number one, the, it's called Remothered, which is a weird title, colon, broke porcelain. And by God, was it, was it certainly broken? Like, it was <laughs> it literally like I couldn't play it anymore. Like, they put out, I guess, a patch later. Like, I tried my best, I tried my damnedest. And even when it was working, it was super janky. I'm like, all right, like, and the story's a little weird, like, it's up its own ass, like, it's, they throw too much, like, stuff that you have to suspend your disbelief for, like, okay, I'll buy that, and like, what, like, what the fuck is that, what, what are you talking about, like, yeah. it just doesn't make sense, like, it seems cool on paper, but I got to this one point where I was, I, I sense to be a monster or find a way to escape it, but it was so literally broken that, like, a monster could never kill me, and I couldn't kill it, like, I got, I remember, <laughs> I walked away from the game, and it was like constantly stabbing me in a corner and I was not dying and I was shooting at it. Like I had a gun. I was like shooting at it infinitely. Like nothing was happening either way. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Like they didn't, they just didn't care. So I'm not going to care. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It, it was, but it seemed cool on paper. So I was like, whatever. So then there's one called, this is the first person walking sim is called those who remain. And it was like, all right. Like I, it, it was sort of like so bog standard and it's, that it's one like, kind of interesting. I remember seeing. Yeah, it. of course it did. Like it seemed cool, right? It seemed Twin Peaksy almost as well, of course, yeah. and that's always gonna get me. Like, all right, I'll check it out. And it, it was just like super forgettable. Like, and even like the gameplay was even for it being a walking sim again was just a little janky, like a little rough around the edges. And then like mm. again, story writing wasn't super compelling, just like sort of flat here and there. I'm like, eh, whatever. Let's get another Edith Finch in here, man. Yeah, I'm waiting for it, man. It was no Edith Finch, I'll tell you that much. 
And like, I almost had this tie, them tie here, but number three on week is something called Made of Skur, which very much in a similar vein as those who remain is like middling, middle tier. Like it had a cool setting. It's bas basically based on a unknown Welsh heart, like ghost story, like folktale, which seemed cool. Like you're in this big haunted hotel up in the hills of like near Scotland, like near Wales. Mm. And um, it seemed really cool. It was less janky, less broken, and like slightly more interesting of a setup and uh, story overall than the previous two. Just, just, but it, at the end of the day, it was like a little like eh as well. Like there were like one or two cool moments, like little set pieces, little like puzzles, but the rest was like eh, whatever. Again, like okay, fine, like yeah. cooler on paper, cooler pitch versus execution. All right, so then uh, again, this is another one that. I've played the first two is Amnesia. Number four is Amnesia Rebirth. I quite liked Amnesia Machine for Pigs. I think it's still the best one, uh, but I was excited for a uh, uh, cool. So the third one, this yeah. one that just came out? So, right. Yeah, so like, I mean, they're not necessarily connected. Like they're just all called Amnesia something, but it's not like they're a one, two, three straight trilogy. It's just like mm. the general setting. Like again, the first person, like horror-ish walking scene. I actually thought um, it the graphically, it looked the best, looked really cool. It was sort of in this weird like desert. And that was like, cool as well so like yeah it was like it's certainly of course i have it as number four was more interesting and better done than the previous three at the end of the day it was like this is for you steve-o in my notes in my original notes i remember this it was completely whelming it was like <laughs> per, it was like here's more amnesia like it was like just more amnesia though like sure like it works it's nothing wrong with it I just feel like they sort of like rested a bit on their heels and like didn't really try to push it further, or like do anything all that more interesting. Like, yeah, it's a cool new different story. And like, yeah, the again, the levels and the world looks cool. But other than that, it's basically the same style of stuff from Amnesia, like previously, without really doing anything, like trying to like change it up or at least introduce something new or unique or to it. So I don't know. Yeah. Like I wasn't disappointed per se. I was like, yeah, okay, that was fine. That was an Amnesia <laughs> game, certainly. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it then, but eh. so finally, my last one is something called uh, Visage, which is sort of under the radar one. Again, first person horrorish walking sim, but I think the way it's sort of like a loop where like you do you go through the same house a whole bunch of times, but like unlocking new parts of it, and you're you're a different character each time. There's like a different story. It's almost like it's the closest it Evo, where like you start. You start, let's say you start story two from this character's pr perspective in the attic of the house right. instead of like, say, the first floor. Or do like, so now I know where certain locations in the house are, but certain ones are also only accessible during, you know, story one or two or character one, two or three or whatever. There's a really, there's a, there's a really interesting way to, to make that story. Like I've seen that done really well before. And it's a shame that it sounds like it wasn't like really all that compelling. It, it was the best horror walking sim amongst these. That's why it's at number five. It's like the closest to you know not being shit sweet. Yeah. But it still was like okay at the end of the day, just relative to the rest. And like, yeah, actually I thought it had a really good the best atmosphere of all of these, I think. Mm. And like some good creepy moments, like no, no cheap jump scares, or like there was one that almost seemed like a jump scare, but it wasn't quite, it was almost like a subversion on a jump scare. Mm -hmm. so I thought that was pretty good. Like that was a good highlight. And like, yeah, it has a darker, more serious story set up. And it just, again, it did in a vague way remind me of Edith, just that it was never, you know, not as good as that. Right. But I thought the stories themselves were cool. And some of the set pieces, the way they, the way you sort of went through different areas of this one creepy house and like did different things with them and like different things would happen in different rooms depending on which story you're on so yeah visage is the number five like okay almost okay yeah <laughs> so that's all my games of the year of 2020 so that i know we're going long but i just want to do tradition is to say one quick thing what i've what i've played this year not not much that came out this year i'm also been playing catch up but i did play um Cyber Shadow, which is like basically Ninja Gaiden as well. Like it's the retro game of this year. It's mm -hmm. it's super hardcore. Like it's super difficult. Like sure, like instant death spikes, like asshole enemies, like trial and error. It was okay, but I got super frustrated with it by the end of it because you just had to be so perfect at it. And I was like, man, I don't have time for this. Like, yes, it's cool and it plays well. It's just that you know, room after room after room on the same stage to like do it perfectly. But it did have a cool artwork and like story was okay, whatever, it's fine. But basically, if you want to play Ninja Gaiden that isn't Ninja Gaiden, 
in, <laughs> for that. this year. Like the most newest one, it's that. Uh, played the medium as well, which is Bluebird team, the team who did Layers of Fear. Speaking of walking sims, like I like them. So medium is not. It's in third person, not first person. And like I thought it was cool, like good enough. Like it certainly was better than Blair Witch, which is one of the games I played of theirs per, like, before this. And whatever, it was fine. Like I liked it, just not completely mind blowing, but very very solid. I would recommend it uh, more than I wouldn't. Uh, we played Werewolf Earthblood, which was also okay. Like it's based on the Werewolf the Apocalypse RPG thing, which I yeah, quite you were excited about that one, right? I was excited for it, and like it's and okay. Now it's like fine, whatever like a ps3 game like at this point like is all right <laughs> like yeah it, it was fun enough like you know what it's kind of repetitive but it was fun to do werewolf flip out fights just turn into a giant werewolf and like you know murder a bunch of guys in a hallway mm-hmm. or corridor but a- after doing that in the same quarter for like 30 times i was like okay like i don't know like the story again was <laughs> eh, whatever um two things i did play so two most recent things uh disco elysium the port finally came out disco elysium the final cut port for consoles super excited to play it i was having a grand old time with it until i hit some very nasty game breaking bugs and as of this date i just got soured on it they did they, they tried to patch it they said hey patch coming it did come eventually later than they said and and uh ps5 first then ps4 but i played it today i downloaded the patch today and, and fixed all your problems it didn't right? fix the shit yeah. and I was like, but the writing is really it really is incredible writing I just would love to be able to play this, the rest of it to see the rest of the story in the writing without having a fucking game-breaking bug. And finally, Outriders also dropped about a day after Disco. Disco and um, it's a new, basically, looter shooter. Like, it's not quite a live service, but it almost can feel like it. There are no microtransactions, and it's a cool world. It's third person. Like, and, you know, you, gr- you play story missions, and then you enemies drop gear, and you get upgraded. You upgrade your shit. Like, there's four classes, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, I was at this point, I'm having way more of a better time than I thought I would have with it. I just wanted to check it out briefly and I kind of got sucked into it sort of by default with disco breaking. I'm like, well, I guess I can't play disco. I might as well play Outriders. And I just did fell into it. I was like, sweet, man. Like, I'm grinding, you know, doing this for, I, I want to get an epic sniper rifle or whatever, right? And mod it out and like get an epic uh, helmet, or whatever. It's because it's looter shooter. Like, it's like Borderlands, the, the, the actual pitch, not even my words, the actual pitch developer's pitch was borderlands meets mass effect i'm like yep that they yep. they nailed it <laughs> like did it and like it works really well it's, it's it's a unique um at least a new ip it's not like based on the previous franchise like a whole new different world kind of feels like gears of war plus titanfall in terms of like the setup of what's happening mm. and i and i also played a bit of it co-op with my friend mikey like which i haven't done in a long long time any game co-op and yeah it actually was quite fun to both of us to go around and like just do some missions and fucking blow guys away with their different abilities. He's playing one class, I'm playing a different one. So a lot of fun. And nice. in fact, at this point, it's the best game I've played in 2021 so far, at least. <laughs> uh, at least the, uh, that, that, that release. The least me. broken one, at least. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it even did have server problems day one or two, which I mentioned again. But they stabilize, and I've never had with it since. So I'll give them credit on that, I suppose. Nice. So that's all my games. And last thing is, uh, real quick, is what's coming up after this. Uh, check out Biomutant. I certainly will be. It looks really cool. It's one of the next games I'm excited for. A couple other cool things coming out. Uh, the do- Speaking of Mass Effect, the Legendary Edition, the trilogy is also coming out in spring or in May. And then Resident Evil 8 also. Speaking of Resident Evil, I'm going to check that out. So those are like the three, four things that I'm looking forward to. There's a couple other stuff, but later on, those are the big ones coming out within a month or less of as of this date. So... That is my mostly ramblings. Uh, sorry to take up all your time and all, but hey, hope you enjoyed listening to me. You got and every, everybody speaks. listening got this full comprehensive yeah. breakdown of like well, you're gonna yeah most of the big games that came out last year and and a lot of what's coming up. So and uh, you'll have an even more comprehensive breakdown because what I do is on top of this episode, I'll re- I'll put out a blog and and dialogue tree or just like my actual thoughts of every game i played this year even ones i haven't mentioned like just everything i played from 2020 yeah so if you really want to read all my ramblings you can do that <laughs> but yeah so thanks for Checking sticking out. along with us if any of these games sound appealing or something sounded cool like check them out the ones i said and avoid the ones i said to avoid so it's, e- it's just that easy baby yeah it's just that easy so i think that'll do it for tonight buddy uh thanks for hanging on thank you all out there for joining us Keep on, keep gaming on, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers.
Thank you for joining the Lost Signals Games and Gaming Culture. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows and more, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates. Thank you.